Hey everyone, welcome to quarantine lesson number seven. We're going to talk about freshwater ecosystems, and I'm going to go a little in depth into a specific ecosystem in the United States. This is the type of work I wanted you to do on your marine and terrestrial ecosystem project from last week. I'm going to breeze through it so that you understand that's what I was looking for when I asked you for two carnivores. This is the type of stuff I wanted you to do. Just like lesson six, I am going to go through too much information for you to put it on one page of your notebook. So make sure that if you need to, you're using both sides of your notebook or just condense it on into one. But again, might as well use both sides because I'm not going to see you again to give you any more left side pages. All right, this is lesson seven. Freshwater ecosystems is your title. How long has it been since I've said, make sure you put your title in your table of contents. Your essential question, what are unique characteristics of freshwater ecosystems? So first of all, what the heck is freshwater? Freshwater means there's no salt from the ocean. Ocean water has a 3.5% salt content. We learned that last lesson. Freshwater does not. Freshwater is created by precipitation. And when evaporation happens, only water goes into steam and condenses into clouds. Eventually, those clouds will rain whenever there gets enough condensation in there and it gets cool enough and then you have precipitation. That precipitation will hit the ground and it'll collect in ponds, lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands and those are some of your freshwater ecosystems. Freshwater is pretty rare. Less than 3% of all water is freshwater. Of that 3%, half of it we can't even use. It's ice and glaciers and in icebergs. The biggest ice areas are Greenland and Antarctica. Of all the precipitation, some of it collects as groundwater. You should have learned the difference between surface water and groundwater when you talked about watersheds in seventh grade. Surface water is all the stuff on the surface, your ponds, your lakes, your streams, and then groundwater is everything that goes down into the soil and eventually it's gonna hit a layer of the Earth's crust that is impermeable. It's a rock layer down there and so the water will collect on top of that rock layer. That collection of the water underground will cause aquifers, and aquifers are a big source of water for humans, and we usually pump water out of those aquifers so that we can use them for irrigation and for cities. So water is a little bit special. First of all, water is most dense at four degrees Celsius and least dense at zero degrees Celsius, which is when it starts forming ice. So that means at zero degrees Celsius or anything colder than zero degrees Celsius is going to float, which is why when you put ice cubes in your drink, they're at the top of your drink. And it has to do with the molecular structure of water and it forms these little crystalline structures whenever it turns into ice and it actually scoots the molecules further apart than it would be at four degrees Celsius. Because of this, only the top layer of a lake will freeze during the winter, which means the under layers are still liquid and fish and other aquatic organisms can live through the winter. Here is an awesome internet drawing that somebody did. Thank you, somebody. That big thick black line across the top is ice. And so you can see the delineation of the temperatures as it goes down. So it's actually warmer at the bottom of the lake than it is at the top of the lake, which is the total opposite of everything we've learned about convection currents. They'll still There'll be a little layer at the bottom where the fish can safely winter where most of them can survive. All right, so we have a couple different types of ecosystems and there's some special sciencey words. There's lintic ecosystems and those would be the ones with not moving water. So those would be your lakes and your ponds. There's lodic ecosystems and lodic water is the fast and moving water of rivers and streams. There are wetlands and wetlands are characterized by there is so much water, the ground is soaked, there's water on top of the ground as well. You can kind of think of it as permanent flood or a seasonal flood. And then we have estuaries. Estuaries are places where freshwater and saltwater meet. So there's like this overlap and you get very specialized plants and animals that can survive both in saltwater and freshwater. All right, so we're gonna focus on the Everglades. The Everglades are wetland in Southern Florida. If you look at the, your little picture there, it's that dark brown in the bottom. Now, that's just the area of the national park that's listed there. The actual area of the Everglades extends all the way north to Lake Okeechobee. It is the big one right there at the end of the A on Florida. 
Uh, the park recognizes nine distinct ecosystems. And the biggest thing that influences those different ecosystems are the hydrologic patterns. Wetlands are saturated water areas, and it's basically like a flood. So from Lake Okeechobee all the way down to the ocean at the bottom of Florida, it's like one big giant flood. The depth of that flood, the duration of that flood, that means how long it's going to like stay flooded, the temperature of the water, the salinity of the water, like how much of it is ocean water right now, how much of it is fresh water right now, and the quality of the water. Those are the things that are the hydrologic patterns that are going to affect the ecosystems. Here's an aerial picture of the Everglades. Notice there are areas with trees. Notice there are areas without trees. Notice it's almost all flooded. Like you can see these little sections of water, but if you look like in the bottom right corner, you'll see in between the grass, you'll actually see ponds of water also. Bromeliads are related to pineapples, so they kind of have this look to them. You know how the top of a pineapple has those layers like that? That's what bromeliads look like. They're also called air plants. They have a symbiotic relationship, a commensalism rela relationship with trees. They will attach to the sides of trees, and they're actually collecting water through their leaves. There are areas of the Everglades that have like a little rocky area. There are some types of cactus and succulents. There are some prickly pear cactus, triangle cactus, this is an agave plant. You have a bunch of types of grasses, and in fact, the Everglades is called a river of grass, and that's like the nickname for it, because the water is constantly flowing from that lake down to the ocean, but as it's flowing slowly, it's going through all this grass and it's making little paths through the grass, and so a lot of the grass can grow in the water, or the land just barely comes above the water, and that's where the grass is. This picture is muley grass. There's also sawgrass, black rush, arrow feather, and Florida blue stem grass. There are also many types of lichens. Lichens, fun fact, are not actually plants. Lichens are a symbiotic relationship between fungus and blue-green algae. This is a type of algae on a tree. They characterize algae as it's basically crusty or fluffy algae, and so this would be a crusty one, and then something like Spanish moss would be the fluffy one. You also have seagrass and algae under the water, and photosynthesis happens underwater because the water is not that deep. Now the seagrass and algae are extremely, extremely important because they literally filter things out of the water as the water flows by. So when water goes through this algae and seagrass, it comes out on the other side cleaner than it was when it came in. And anytime there is an island above the water, trees are gonna collect there. There's a bunch of different types of trees. This is a little group of mangrove trees. You also have some willow trees, oak trees, live oak trees, ironwood trees, palm trees, and cypress trees. There is a special tree that I found when I was looking stuff up. I don't know exactly how to say it. Manchineal tree and its sap is toxic and it's one of the most poisonous plants in the world. Be careful what you touch out there. So let's talk about some of the consumers. The amphibians would include frogs, toads, tree frogs, newts, and sirens. I specifically got a picture of the Florida cricket frog and the Everglades dwarf siren. I picked the siren because it's related to a salamander and see how it has like almost like ears behind its head there. Those are not ears. Those are gills. They have external gills. You know how like fish have gills that filter oxygen out of the water. Sirens have gills that filter oxygen out of the water as well. But the gills are on the outside of them instead of the inside of them like fish are. So they have like little feathery things behind their head that allow them to live underwater. Other consumers include birds. I'm going to focus on the wading birds. Those are the birds that live like in the water and walk through the water. Keep in mind there are thousands of other birds. All kinds of migratory birds come through. Any bird that lives in any tree in the eastern United States also lives there. So they have like all the bluebirds and the robins and the, and the mockingbirds and all those kinds of birds also. But like I said, I'm going to focus on the wading birds. So those are storks and herons, egrets, spoonbills, ibises, and things like that. Here's a couple pictures of them. I picked the great egret, which is the white one on the left, and the wood stork, which is on the right. 
because there's a lot of water everywhere, there's a lot of fish also. Some of the common fish that are found and are allowed for you to fish while you're in the national park include red snapper, sea trout, redfish, bass, and bluegill. Here is a picture of a snapper and a sea trout. If you look up the snapper, you can see they're actually gigantic. They're like holding these fish and they almost look fake because they're so huge. They're like two feet long. The sea trout is a little special because it has these teeth on it, bottom teeth and like a big old front fang on it. And just like everywhere else in the world, there are a whole bunch of insects, spiders, scorpions, ticks, mosquitoes, mites, butterflies, dragonflies, and all those kinds of things. That whole group is called arthropods. Here are a couple of them. The one on the left is the golden silk orb weaver spider. That person, by the way, is not trying to touch the spider. That person just has their hand there so that you can see how big the spider really is. I know a big spider like that is scary and some of you are probably wishing I would hurry up and get off this page because it's creeping you out. Now you're not going to be able to sleep at night because you're going to think about spiders on you. But you want big spiders like this because they're eating big insects. The picture on the right is an eyed click beetle. It's called eyed because see on the thorax there, it looks like it has a couple little spots like their eyes, even though it's real eyes are further frontwards, closer to it as antenna. Now that would be a camouflage technique. Actually, it's not a camouflage, it's called mimicry. And so by having those eyes there, it almost looks like a snake head. And so if you were a bird just flying by and you saw that, you would be like, oh my God, a snake. And then you wouldn't grab it. Now that's not a small beetle. It still can get up to like two inches long but it does use that eye spots there to make it look like it's a bigger organism than it really is so that small predators don't eat it and then we have all the mammals they're all the things that you usually think about that live in a forest right so there's squirrels mice deer there's a, an endangered species called the florida panther there's bobcats bats possums they have an armadillo um, one of the very special mammals that is only found here is the manatee. So your picture on the left shows the manatee. They are also called sea cows because guess what they eat? The seagrass. Some people think manatees are what cause the myth about mermaids. I don't know about you, but those don't really look like mermaids to me. They are rather large and fat being like, you know, sea cowish. And in fact, they move very, very slowly. A lot of manatees have scars on their backs because when boats go by, the propeller will actually cut their backs because they're slow to get out of the way. And then the one on the right is called a round tail muskrat. They're native to the Everglades and look at him, he's not that bad, he's kind of cute. All right, and lastly, we have some reptiles. Special one for the Everglades is the American alligator. There's bunches of types of snakes, whole bunch of types of snakes. Um, geckos, turtles, including sea turtles, because remember, the ocean goes up next to it there, and so it's an estuary. Here are a couple of the native species, the eastern indigo snake. Yes, it's several feet long. And then the American alligator. Alligators are only found in a couple places around the world. So alligators are one of those special things that are found along the southern United States. So that is the end of our lesson seven about freshwater ecosystems. If we were doing a project about freshwater ecosystems, you could have used some of those organisms when talking about which ones are carnivores, which ones are secondary consumers and stuff like that. So you could have said that giant orb spider is a secondary consumer. The muskrat is a primary consumer. You could have said the snake is a carnivore as well as the egret and the stork. That's the kind of stuff I wanted you to do on your marine and terrestrial ecosystem project. I'm gonna have to go through those and I'm gonna have to look at all of the animals and plants that you put down. I'm gonna send it back. I have to grade them. So right now it says that you have no grade. I have to literally go through and give you a yes or a no or a check or, check or a minus for each individual organism and I'm gonna send it back. If you would like to redo that project so that you get a higher grade, you can do that and turn it in later. I hope you paid attention because there's gonna be some very specific questions on your Google Classroom quiz about freshwater ecosystems and the Everglades. I got all my information from the Everglades National Park website and it's up there in the top corner. I hope you're doing well, stay safe. I'll see you next week for lesson eight.